Hi, y'all. Uh, the second to last uh, event this evening is our plenary speech from Dr. Stacy Brown. Uh, the similarity in our last names is no coincidence. In addition to being an excellent educator, Stacy is my wife. And it was, in fact, uh, Stacy here who first introduced me to Pogel. So Mike and I have that in common. Um, we have very attractive, very smart wives who teach us how to teach very well. So we're very happy about that. So tonight, uh, I'm not going to give you a very long introduction. Uh, Stacy's talk is going to be somewhat autobiographical. And uh, so I'm just going to leave it to Stacy to tell you all about how she liked that song before it was popular. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for your introduction, Patrick. Uh, so now you're not going to wonder why I got asked to do this. Um, but I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited uh, to see a good turnout this evening. When uh, Patrick first asked me to, to, to do this talk, I thought a long time about what in the world could I talk about with this diverse group of faculty from high school and college and, and with different levels of teaching experience. I don't really know the answer to that yet, so um, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about what um, got me into doing Pogel um, and got me here to ETSU where I started doing a little bit of scholarship of teaching and learning stuff. It's not my expertise. I'm an analytical chemist, so I know how to do that kind of research a little bit better, but I have learned in uh, the last 10 years to pay attention to what you do in the classroom, and if you do something different, pay attention to how it works. That's called assessment. I actually didn't know that until I came to the College of Pharmacy, but um, th it's useful to pay attention to what you're doing and if it works, uh, yes or no. And then just talk a little bit about where I think um, my experience with Pogel and with uh, teaching and learning is going to take myself and my role in our college uh, moving forward. So Part of uh, tonight, like Patrick said, is a bit autobiographical. I want to tell a little bit of a story of my last 10 years of, uh, of my career, which has kind of encompassed my experience with uh, doing uh, Pogel-like stuff as well as other active learning stuff. So I started my career um, there on the left-hand side of the slide at the Citadel, and this is a um, school in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a military college, so all the faculty wear uniforms. Uh, and uh, that's as great as it sounds. Um, <clears throat> I was literally six days out of graduation from UGA. I didn't do a postdoc. I got into an academic position right away. So I graduated on August the 15th, and my first class was August the 21st. And it was a recipe for success like no other. It was this huge auditorium with you know, 200 seats, I had a book, and I had a chalkboard. It was going to be awesome. Um, and uh, so I went in there, and I taught a course that was uh, creatively named Chemistry for the non-science major. I taught a few sections of this course and a bazillion labs of this course, and I did it in a way that I thought was perfect. And the students really liked me, and they gave me great reviews, and I just had a great time. I was like, man, I'm a rock star at teaching. This is really going well. And that lasted until the final exam. And uh, the final exam was actually assembled by all of the faculty that taught in the course with common questions. So essentially, we all gave the same final. And I was like, Psh, no problem with that. My students are awesome. They've done great on my tests. And I knew I had written good tests because I took a one-hour class Actually, it only met for one hour ever, a class about test writing. So I was totally an expert in that, and um, I was also an expert in writing things on the chalkboard. So I was doing really great, and here comes the final, and my students did terrible. They scored easily two standard deviations below their peers. Um, over 40% of them did not know the formula for water. And this was a proud moment in my teaching career. I. Uh, I share it with you now because I can laugh at it, but at the time I was pretty devastated. And I started getting ready for the next semester, 
but also looking for jobs, you know, the old way in the back pages of c and &E News, um, not other academic jobs, but other jobs where I wouldn't be asked to teach anything, because uh, I thought that, well, I've obviously made a terrible mistake. Um, I lumbered through the next semester, same result on that final exam, what in the world am I doing wrong? And so I decided that summer, I said, okay, we gotta do something. I'm gonna overhaul my course. And I did. And by overhaul, I mean I took all that junk I used to write on the chalkboard and I made PowerPoint slides. And I was like, all right, now it's on. Now they're gonna learn some chemistry. and. Uh, what was even more encouraging about this is that my department chair thought that I was a technology genius. Nobody else was doing PowerPoint, and this is going to be the revolution of our department. It's going to be wonderful. Um, and the students were fine with it. They, you know, they were sort of ambivalent. It was a course that was required, so nobody was busting down the doors to take the course anyway. They had to do it. And um, many of you will not be surprised to learn that they actually did worse. So it's my third semester. I'd done this beautiful overhaul, and my students were doing worse than ever. And I had yet to make the connection between how hard I worked on this end and how much they learned. I thought, you know, my slides are the most beautiful slides ever made for general chemistry. How could they not be learning anything? I'm giving them all the material. I gave them the material, and yet they still can't answer questions about the formula of water. And so I said, all right, I'm going to have to be thinking about a different way to do this. PowerPoint isn't the, um, the holy grail that I expected. So um, I uh, was encouraged and by encouraged, uh, was strongly encouraged, which meant you better go, um, to attend a faculty development seminar. And this was a three-day workshop given by uh, Dr. Richard Paul, who's an expert in critical thinking. And I didn't know what faculty development meant, but what strongly encouraged meant, so I went. And um, Dr. Paul's um, workshop, I'm sure it was very nice, it was three days, but what I learned from that workshop, I learned in the first probably hour in his introduction lecture. And what his introduction told me is that there is old data, 1978, 1985 data that says that a student's attention span is about 10 to 18 minutes. 10 to 18 minutes? Are you kidding? 10 to 18 minutes. 10 is pretty average. 18, if they're well rested, well fed, they love you, they love the topic, they're engaged, you get about 18 minutes. And if you quiz them, if you lecture for an hour and you quiz them on it, they'll remember stuff from the first few minutes. The rest is just lost. And this is this is data that's been around for a while. And I'm sitting there trying to understand how in the world people knew this, and yet that's all I had ever known as a student. And so I sat there and I actually started calculating things like how many hours I had wasted in the classroom with my own students, how many hours that meant per semester, how many tuition dollars that meant that I had wasted. And I said, well, no wonder they're doing so badly. I'm wasting their time every day and I'm wasting their money. And um, this kind of hurt because it made me feel even more like a failure, um, but it also made me kind of look at my bachelor's degree a little bit different. I was like, well, yeah, no wonder I couldn't calculate, uh, you know, I couldn't do PKA problems when I went to graduate school. No wonder I couldn't, um, because I probably memorized it for a test, and I guarantee you I made an A on that test, but I couldn't tell you how to do it two years later. And so there was a little bit of disappointment, a little frustration behind that, but then sort of regrouped myself. I'm like, all right, we're going to have to do something different. It's not going to be a PowerPoint. It has to be something else. And so I did a lot of reading and a lot of searching, and I stumbled upon um, a regional meeting for ACS that um, was offering a one-day POGL workshop. And I didn't know what that was. But I knew the meeting was in Memphis, Tennessee, and my sister had just moved there. So I thought, how convenient. I can visit my sister, and maybe I will learn something under this umbrella that's called faculty development. So I applied for a little grant, got some money to go out to Memphis, and, uh, 
and did the one-day workshop, and it really changed my thinking on the way I should be behaving in the classroom. Um, I ended up getting the book that's uh, shown here, which is probably familiar to many of you um, in the room. And while the exercises in this book weren't uh, ready to go for my students, um, that were the difficulty was a bit too much. Um, I just used the book as an inspiration to develop some exercises that went along with their textbook. So, you know, I saw well, how does this book, um, the written the Moog book, teach atoms? All right, well, how does their textbook teach atoms? Then I try to sort of meld the two and develop some exercises that were um, Pogol-ish. I didn't know about the rubric. I didn't know about all the rules at the time, but I was trying to stumble along. And uh, lo and behold, things got better. Um, each semester after that, I, I wrote a few more, put a few more out there, um, and uh, the student performance got better and better. Um, my biggest challenge at the Citadel was that it was a military school, and the students had ranks. And so you had to be really intentional with forming those groups because if you had a high-ranking senior and a low-ranking freshman together, that group wasn't, just wasn't going to function well. So you had to be cognizant of that. But other than that, um, there, there were few stumbling blocks. They went really well. And I got excited about it, started telling everybody about Pogel, and everybody just looked at me like, hmm. Well, I see that you're feeding them the assessment questions at the end of the semester. Good for you for cheating and ruining our test. And so I was accused of, of um, you know, of, of teaching them the test, and therefore they were doing better. That's the only way to explain the fact that my students had suddenly improved. And so while this was frustrating, I said, well, it's not going to matter because I'm changing jobs. And uh, I came to ETSU. Um, I was one of the inaugural faculty at the College of Pharmacy here. So that's 2007. I couldn't find a picture of that uh, group. Uh, so I just put one of the recent ones. So there's a lot fewer of us when I started. But that's us on the right, and I'm somewhere in the middle. In one of these pictures, I was wearing a tiara. And I couldn't find that picture either for some reason. Um, so anyway, this is a more um, probably the most recent one. Um, so I started my job here um, at ETSU, and I was hired to teach medicinal chemistry. So I said, all right, you know, I'm a chemist. I know how to do this, and I'm going to do Pogel um, in my medicinal chemistry classroom. Um, but um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I didn't realize coming into a college of pharmacy that my background with Pogel and just in general starting to learn about active learning was going to be so important. But it's really important to pharmacy education and it's really important to medical education. Why? Because the knowledge base grows and it grows exponentially. But you can't make your semester longer and longer and longer to encompass all the new drugs that are on the market, our new you know, understanding of disease. You can't do that every single, um, every single year because we don't have infinite time. And so as the years go by, you have to be more and more intentional in teaching your students how to take new information, process it, analyze it, and apply it on their own because you can't deliver in the way all of the things that, that they may encounter in their careers. So active learning, very important in, um, in the field of pharmacy. And specific to pharmacy, some um, individuals had researched just the confidence levels of students who are in their fourth year of a pharmacy curriculum, and they go out into those, um, those clerkships, those rotations, and they found that students that come with a more active learning background in their curriculum are more able to perform in a clinical setting because they can take that new information and process it and analyze it and apply it quickly um, for patient care. So realizing that, that my background could be a fundamental part of our College of Pharmacy uh, was uh, very reassuring. And then even more so was this little knock on the door from our assessment, um, our accreditation agency, um, AC, that said, yeah, we think it's important too. And uh, we're not going to mandate it just yet, but one day we will. And so it's kind of hanging over us like, yeah, it's important, and we're going to codify that one day. And so um, 
I, I was interested um, when I first started, and so were a couple of other uh, of my colleagues interested in, all right, active learning is so important in the field of pharmacy. How many people are doing it? Who's doing this and what are they doing? And so we set out for my first little research project at ETSU, um, set out to do a survey, and we just sent a little, I mean, we even titled the email a three-minute survey um, about active learning to all the faculty and colleges of pharmacy. And we got um, a, a representative from 95% of the colleges responded to our survey, which we thought was very exciting. At the time, it was 114 um, different programs that, that uh, responded. And what we wanted to know is, do you, do you use active learning in your classroom? What percentage of your teaching encompasses active learning? And what exactly are you doing? Um, we also asked questions about rank and department and um, the private versus public pro pro program, things like that. And what did we find? Um, well, first of all, we found that 87% of our respondents said, yeah, I do some kind of active learning. And I was like, well, you know, that's a little higher than I expected, but maybe that's skewed because I do it and I'm more likely to respond to the survey. Um, we found that among those people, though, they said that only about 30% of their time at most was spent doing active learning in the classroom. It's like, okay, well, maybe a lot of people do it, but a lot of people doing a little bit of it. So that's kind of interesting. Um, what kind of things were they doing? First and foremost, they were doing problem-based and case-based learning. And this is not surprising at all because uh, there are whole pharmacy curricula that are problem-based curricula. There are whole you know, schools that mandate that all the courses are taught like that. So that wasn't very, um, very surprising, nor was it the prevalence of like a discussion-based platform or team-based learning, the frequency of that very surprising. And then right there at the bottom, but I put it at the top because we're at a POGLE meeting, um, was POGLE and inquiry-based learning. So the fewest, that was the smallest group of people, and you know, I was one of those respondents. What kind of things predict um, what, if a faculty member is going to be willing to use active learning in their classroom? One of the biggest predictors is age and um, which core it tends to correlate with rank. So your newer professors, your younger assistant professors um, who are new to teaching typically um, are twice as likely than a full professor to use some kind of active learning. And why is this? Well, if it's gaining prevalence in pharmacy education, then these individuals are more likely to have seen it. And just like me, who emulated what I had seen as a student, they may be emulating what their faculty were doing at their college. So more likely if you are a newer faculty member. If you're in a clinical department or one of our social behavioral departments where you, you know, do pharmacy administration or pharmacy law, three and a half um, more times likely than the basic sciences or the pharmaceutical sciences, and that's where I would fall, to do active learning. And this is probably because these fields, it's easier to see how you would do it. And, you know, it's easier to see how you would teach, uh, you know, disease management using an active case-based approach maybe versus the Krebs cycle. You know, how do you teach that in an active learning environment? So it's just, uh, this sort of made sense, not very surprising to us. What was most surprising, I thought, was the teaching load effect. So those individuals that had the highest teaching loads with an expectation of teaching greater or greater than or equal to 80% of their assignment, they were six times more likely than those on the other end of the continuum to do active learning. So this says, yeah, if you are the person who's doing a lot of teaching, you're using these tools, and that has to say something about their, um, about their validity. So we're very excited about, uh, you know, about our survey, and we learned a lot about active learning and pharmacy education. And then we said, all right, um, well, what are we doing here at the College of Pharmacy? You know, we we responded to the survey, but are we are we uh, are we practicing what we preach here at the College of Pharmacy? And to be honest, <clears throat> the first semester I was not. Hmm. I'm not used to lecturing so much. Um, <clears throat> I love the irony of this, by the way. Um, the first semester I taught MedChem, it was a repeat of the Citadel. Okay. 
I had a little bit more time, more than six days, about four weeks from the time I walked onto ETSU's campus till the time my class started, but had this big auditorium. I had a whiteboard and I had a book. And um, I was really just, I never taught the course before, staying one step ahead of those students and just putting these lectures together every day. And I knew in the back of my mind, like, Stacy, you are not doing the best job you could, but I'm just getting by. Um, here. I'm just getting through this first semester and then after that we'll sort of sort it out. We'll make it better. And that's what I tried to do. So what I have here are just some demographics from three semesters that I ended up looking at from a research perspective to see how effective instituting some guided inquiry um, exercises would be in teaching medicinal chemistry. So our fall 2007, that's my control group, my lecture um, group, and uh, just read an article recently, Patrick pointed it out to me, where it talked about maybe taking, using um, the, your lecture as the control group isn't a good idea anymore. It's kind of like giving a placebo to a group of patients of a drug you know works. Um, so I thought that was sort of interesting. Now looking back, I'm like, yeah, I knew that it was a bad idea, but I didn't know what else to do. And uh, so fall 2008, fall 2009, I'm starting to introduce act, uh, some more active learning, some inqu inquiry, um, guided inquiry based into MedCam. And um, I didn't still, I'm not real versed on the rubrics, so I never really tried to call them POGL because I knew they, they might not pass all the little rules, but I knew that they were guided inquiry because I was introducing a model, having the students explore the model and develop their own ideas about what is the nature of this drug class, why does this drug class work, why can you... Uh, why does this drug get uh, better absorption than this drug based on their chemical structures? So that's what I was trying to do. And I compared my two treatment groups, fall 08, fall of 09 to fall 2007. I put these data up here to just demonstrate the beauty of doing this kind of work in a college of pharmacy because you have cohorts of students that are essentially equal. They're about the same size and number, same gender distribution, same age, and then those predictors, so you know, things that you would typically associate with uh, predicting academic success, GPA, and then the PCAT, which is our entrance exam, pretty much the same. I did, you know, I don't know a lot of statistics, so I did some t-tests and said, ah, these are the same. They're not, not statistically different. So I felt good about comparing these particular cohorts of, of students. And what did I find? Um, well, I found that when I taught the course with a lecture format in 2007, which is the blue um, students, I found that that my grade distribution was a BC distribution. So 86% of my students made it either a B or a C. But then when I switched the format um, to an inquiry base, a guided inquiry based uh, format, my grade distribution shifted into the AB range. Whereas the first semester I just had a handful of A's, but then the second semester, I had like 35 A's out of 66. Um, and, you know, I realized that this, these data don't look maybe as striking as some data that you've seen uh, earlier today or you may see in the, the Pogel literature where you see an undergraduate classroom being affected. Um, these data are still exciting to us because we're talking about groups of students that are going to succeed no matter what. So we're just helping them succeed through guided inquiry at a little bit higher level. I mean, 90% of the students that walk through our doors graduate in four years and never make a grade lower than a C. So they're going to be fine. We don't have that DFW rate to contend with, but we did see a shift in our distribution of, uh, of grades in MedChem. So, of course, I've continued to follow this model and each year trying to make my exercises just a bit better. And and I couldn't have, um, after looking back at these, um, these data and looking at my student evaluations, I couldn't have written more flattering comments for my own self. Um, the students were very excited about the guided inquiry format. Um, I call the, the exercises, I'm very creative, in-class exercises because we do them in class. Um, and uh, they said these are, these are the key to my understanding. Um, they said that 
this is so much better than listening to lecture, that they used higher level thinking skills. I'm like, man, I couldn't have written a better thing. That's perfect. I wish that um, I knew who said that so I could give them a hug. Um, but these things all made, you know, all made me feel a bit validated about what we were trying to do um, in medicinal chemistry. And one of the last comments is also very important because the student here says, it wasn't easy. I didn't like this class so much because it was easy. I liked it because I now feel comfortable with a set of material that before was very intimidating. And uh, if you poll pharmacy students, you're going to find that medicinal chemistry is not at the top of the favorites. Um, it certainly wasn't at the University of Georgia. And so to have them uh, say, yeah, I'm comfortable with this stuff and it's still not easy to me, but I feel good about it, that uh, made me feel like we're doing the right, right thing as far as uh, our approach to teaching it. But uh, I don't uh, want to do everything the same, so I, I sort of get distracted. And I said, you know, maybe I could uh, use some other strategies in my teaching. So I did um, work a bit with case-based teaching, and this was in the development of a toxicology elective. Um, so in any given semester that the elective was offered, about half of our students, so in a class of 80, you know, 40 are taking it, 40 are not. And after a few iterations of my new elective, this is actually representing two iterations, I said, all right, let's look back at these students. Um, these students, I mean, they did fine in toxicology. I didn't have a control group because now I'm convinced that I shouldn't have a control group. I just have a group and we'll just see what else, uh, what else is affected. And here I wanted to look at um, content overlap because we know that if you kind of present the same thing in several contexts, students tend to get a better grasp on it. Um, I experienced this as an undergraduate where I was taking physical chemistry and biochemistry and inorganic at the same time and there was actually some content overlap. I was like, okay, I kind of get this. Um, and in toxicology, there was some content overlap with a pharmacology course, which is a more which is in the basic science, pharmaceutical science realm, and a pharmacotherapy course, which is a more applied clinical course. There was content overlap with my course and these. I saw with this between the students who were in the toxicology elective and those who were not, I saw a difference in their performance in the clinical course. So in uh, pharmacotherapy, the average grade was an 89 for students in the elective and an 83 for the students who were not. Once again, it's not a huge difference, but these students are going to pass regardless. They're going to be fine regardless because the grades are usually in the B range. So um, our conclusions from this, looking at pharmacology and saying, well, there's no advantage in the basic science course, was that it might be a function of the way the toxicology course was taught. It might be a function of a case-based model where the students now are starting to learn how to take new information and process it and work in teams to figure out um, to figure out the solution to a problem. And so we said, you know, it could be that. It's not just a matter of content overlap that's giving my uh, toxicology students an advantage. Now, the bars on the far left where it says PCOA, um, this is actually a standardized test that is given, well, we use it as a tool in our college um, for benchmarking. So we give it to our students in the third year, and then we look at how we compare to other programs. And... With these students that had taken toxicology in their second year, we look at PCOA results in the third year and we say, all right, first of all, the students that took the toxicology elective, they remembered it. They're in the you know, 90, 92nd percentile um, for the parts of the PCOA that pertain to toxicology because it's all mapped to the whole, uh, you know, the accreditation standards. And, uh, and they outperformed their peers who weren't in the class but their peers were right at the national average. So they were outperforming the, the kids from our benchmark schools in the toxicology content. So I said, all right, they're not only getting help in their other courses, but they're keeping it um, in their brains. And this is important in a, in a pharmacy program because they take this licensure exam at the end. So they have to know stuff, not just for the test on that day. So. We're very excited about this, and this whole time, I've been kind of sort of trying to plant some seeds with other faculty in the College of Pharmacy. It's like, look, you can do active learning. It's great. Look how much uh, it can help your students. And um, I don't know how much people were listening, but um, 
but they kind of started to listen um, as the, our college started to talk about curricular integration. And up until this point, we'd had really, um, traditional curriculum where the students for a semester and a half took basic science, pharmaceutical science, and then they switched gears, did the clinical stuff the last two and a half years. And what we said we want to do is be more intentional in, in um, integrating these two things. So the students don't have the basic science of um, antimicrobials in their first year, but don't learn about the therapeutic implications of those till their third year. We don't want that disconnect. So we're going to integrate that. What a great opportunity for active learning. That's what you would think. But my reaction in the initial discussions about curricular integration was, no, not interested, because it's going to mess up my class. And my class is awesome. And I don't want to spread my class and dilute all this awesomeness out among all of your courses. I want to keep my awesomeness to myself. And, um, you know, as I sat around smugly um, contemplating how problematic it was going to be if I had to dilute my class, um, I, uh, I started thinking about uh, those people in college that said, well, you know, I liked that song before it was popular, but now it's popular, I don't like it anymore. Or I went to see that band for $3, and, um, you know, that's before anybody knew about them, but now... Mm, they're on the radio. I don't like it anymore. And so in thinking about those individuals, I said, oh, that's what I'm doing. People are knocking at the door, and they want to be able to take what I do and spread it out and maybe learn to do it themselves, and maybe I don't need to be so smug about it. Maybe I need to say, all right, I can help you do that. Here's how this is going to look. And so our discussions went really starting with, all right, well, we're not really going to change much about the curriculum. We're just going to take the same stuff and arrange it around, maybe just put it in a different order. It'll be fine. It's not really going to be that different to maybe we should make it a more active experience for the students. And how should we do that? How should we do it? Should we require everybody to do a certain thing? Should everybody be doing different things? How should we do it? But at the center of all that discussion, uh, you know, is, is myself and just a couple of other individuals who people are turning to. So, all right, how, how are we going to do this? How do you think we should do this? And so I had to let go of that smugness a bit and uh, say, okay, I can help, and we can all like this song. Um, but as we are working to... Um, to revise our curriculum and to move into this integrated model, which we're a year um, into as of August 5th, 14th, which would be actually first day. Um, but we'll be doing our uh, first year of the integrated part um, starting this semester. We get this uh, little trickle from our accreditation body that says, all right, you're coming up for reaccreditation. And that's all well and good, but after you're reaccredited, we're going to put some new standards in place. And in one of those standards, we're going to codify this thing about active learning. We're going to say, listen, if you are going to deliver a pharmacy curriculum that is recognized by our accreditation agency, you have to show us that you actively engage learners in your classroom, that you provide a collaborative learning environment for them. It does not say about pretty PowerPoint slides, unfortunately. So we have a lot of thinking and a long way to go along these lines as we try to fix our curriculum and do a little something different with that and also try to bring a lot of people up to speed with not just um, getting excited about active learning, but really trying to figure out, well, how does that work for that individual person in that individual classroom? <clears throat> and so with all that, I feel like... Um, I feel like there should be some closing points. We should take uh, take something home with you. And so, first, uh, ooh, my first point is that uh, that we should just do it now and do it as well. Take your momentum from this workshop and just go try to do something. And it might not be perfect, and it might just be one exercise, and it might not pass the rubric. <laughs> But do it and try it. And by doing it well, that doesn't mean that every single thing you do needs to be perfect um, according to 
according to any other um, you know any other teaching style, but by doing it well, what I mean is do it with respect and fairness for the students because that's what they want. You know, if you if you treat them fairly and you respect them and you keep the morale in the classroom high, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff and they're going to be on board with it because they know that in the end of the day, you're not going to punish them if your pogo exercise flopped, okay? Um, another aspect of doing it well is selling it to them. And I know that we kind of talk about this throughout the workshop, but um, this um, this cannot be under, the importance of this can't be underestimated. Uh, if you're going to do something that looks different to the students, they need to kind of know it up front, like, okay, something's about to happen. Here it is, and here's why. I do this, I have kind of an advantage because I'm in a, a medical field, and I say, look, <clears throat> we're supposed to be teaching you evidence-based medicine here. We preach that for four years to you. I'm going to do a little evidence-based teaching too, okay? So there's some evidence to suggest that the way I'm going to teach this class has benefit to you. And so they recognize they like that evidence-based term, and they say, okay, we're on board. We, we're, we got it. Second point to take home is don't be smug. When you go back to your college, when you go back to your individual schools and your departments, and your colleagues do not know what Pogel is, do not think less of them. If they do not even know what active learning is, do not look down on them. I did not know what this was when I started um, teaching. I, I did not know any terms related to any kind of learning. In fact, I didn't really know the difference between learning and making an A. <laughs> Like, I thought that I had just learned all kinds of great things because I made a lot of A's. But I maybe hadn't learned as much as I thought. So actually embracing the concept of learning in general, um, I hadn't done as a new faculty member. So don't judge them. And then if they want to learn about Pogel or if they want to come to your classroom or um, they want to just sit down and bounce some ideas with you, don't be smug about it. Just, you know, just embrace um, their willingness to learn because you're all doing it because you want to do a better job for the students. So keep that in mind. Don't waste uh, time like I did. And then finally, think beyond um, today and think beyond tomorrow and think beyond the first day of the semester. Um, we tend to get tied up day to day when we're in a course. Um, like, oh, we got to get our materials for tomorrow. And then that's over. Okay, we got to get our materials for tomorrow. And we're sort of stumbling along day to day. But occasionally kind of zoom out, look at your students as a whole. You know, how are they doing? How's the morale of the class? Um, can I collect any data here that will help me understand how effective this is? And then back out even farther, all right, for a whole year, how effective has this been? What can I improve? What can I change? And um, <clears throat> start to think of yourself not just as the person who teaches general chemistry for non-science majors um, or whatever it is, but think of yourself as a leader because that's what you are when you do these kind of things that we know work in the classroom. You're providing leadership in your classroom, in your college, in your school. Um, and I'm not trying to imply that you're going to get a promotion because of this or a new title that's all fancy with like a gold sign on your door. But um, and being a leader is not about getting a title. The title doesn't make you a leader. Um, what makes you a leader is your ability and your willingness to uh, impart change, even if it's tiny. So I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. What questions do you have? You see, in a course where I learned about teaching communication to healthcare professionals, I was taught never to say, are there any questions? Because the answer is always no. So, what questions do you have? That's what you're supposed to ask. Yes, ma'am. As far as like um, what 
tools do I use to assign their grade at the end? Um, I just, I don't do anything different. I mean, our students, I, my thinking for our students since they take this licensure exam at the end is that part of the skill of taking that exam is learning to take tests and take them well and quickly and accurately, and so I do multiple choice testing. Um, because that's what they're gonna see on the, the NAPLEX, and uh, I try to map my questions to what the NAPLEX, our licensure test says they need to know, and uh, I just test in a traditional way. Part of that also is that I don't have time to grade 80 papers, and I would love to you know, have them maybe write something, but Lord have mercy, I just don't have time for that. <laughs> so, um, so it's really no different than if I were lecturing. Um, they do struggle a little bit, especially the first test, figuring out how to study because they're used to like just learning all the stuff on the slides. And so having this stack of this other thing that they've been doing in class is a little bit intimidating. Uh, so for the first test in my course, I always do kind of a review session with those clickers. I'll just make a bunch of, I'll pull questions from old tests and make little clicker slides and like, this is the kind of thing you're gonna see, all right? If you can do this, you can do the test and put them at ease like, hey, you know stuff, it's okay. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, well, just thank you. I guess what I'm gonna say, you don't assess the project just do the testing that in that fashion. Yeah, I don't uh, really check them for accuracy because the in my course they always report out to the board by the end of class. So hopefully if it, you were breathing during class and had your eyes open, you could have gotten all the answers. So you should, everybody should have an accurate paper. But I do give them a little bit of points for for um, being there and working in the group. And uh, I ask my group managers um, to decide whose name gets on the paper <laughs> because sometimes they'll leave people off because that person was texting or whatever else they were doing. And they were in the room, but they don't get any credit. And uh, boy, the students sort of love doing that. <laughs> um, so they get, uh, they get recognized for participating and contributing in that way, but it's not a huge you know, a huge percentage. Yes. Can you elaborate more on how you were able to get faculty buy-in from your department? Like, was that difficult? I mean, well, it's mm, it can be difficult. I didn't really get when I was at the Citadel. I got zero buy-in, almost like more hostility than buy-in, and. At the College of Pharmacy, we actually have a lot of enthusiasm for it, but also a lot of, yeah, that's your thing. You're doing great at it. I could never do that. And uh, so, you know, gradually I've gotten a few people more interested uh, to the point where we have one other faculty member that's actually writing some exercises. And she was here earlier um, today. And other people who have asked me, like, I'm going to try something in my class today. Can you? watch and see how it works and give me some feedback. So I'm starting to get more of that. Um, not necessarily people following a Pogel model, but just a little bit more like, okay, I'm going to put myself out there and, and try it. Um, part of what makes people nervous is the fear that maybe as a college we're going to adopt a philosophy of we do this kind of active learning here. And nobody's really in favor of that, but I think a lot of people are a little bit fearful that that may happen as this accreditation standard has come down. So there's a little bit of trepidation, like, oh, are they gonna make me do a certain thing? Because if they wanna make me, I don't wanna do it at all. Um, but right now we're sort of in the phase of, well, I'm interested. And I don't necessarily want to do that, but I'm going to try to do this uh, instead. So it's been very gradual, and uh, I think that it's the urgency has stepped up just a little bit for us because of curricular integration, because we actually have kind of less time to do more now because we've meshed all this stuff and, um, and the new accreditation standard. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
obviously you're a big advocate for the POGA one. My question is, of your student contact hours, what percent do you need to do a formal lecture or do you not formally lecture at all? Um, well, I um, we have the advantage, first of all, in our own little pharmacy world of making our own schedule. So like our students aren't um, at the mercy of how ETSU schedules courses because we schedule all our own and we make them as long as we want. And I like a two hour block. So the way I treat a two hour block, which is where I bug the uh, the uh, person in academic affairs enough that she always gives me my two hour block. Um, the way I treat that is I spend the first 15 minutes or so, I try not to break that 18 minute rule that was drilled in my head so long ago, uh, about 15 minutes and I do a little short lecture, then we break into groups, they do the exercise and I will um, as the groups are working through the exercise, I go around, I'm like, okay, y'all are finished with number one, I need it on the board. And I'll get the groups to report all the answers on the board, and then um, at the end, sometimes I will say, all right, you got something different from them, go put that up, and we'll get some different answers. And then we just sort of go through, and I'll let them uh, duke it out a little bit and debate things that are different. But And I might do a short recap at the end, maybe 10 minutes at the very end. Just like, all right, we did all this mess. Now, what do you need to take home? What is what is the most important uh, concept here in the end? So I do use some lecture. Um, just because part of it is because we don't have a good textbook that... Um, that I like that's not a bazillion dollars. So we have a good textbook, but it's a bazillion dollars. So I choose a cheaper textbook and I try to supplement a lot of stuff in the lecture. So so I use it a little bit, but try not to abuse it. Hi. Yes, sir. I got a couple questions. Okay. Um, so um, one has to do is when, when you, I'll ask the first one. First. Okay. So when you're preparing your inquiry-based lesson plan, um, do you, outside of that, the plan that you talked about, do you have either a sign reading prior to class or a paper that they need to read after class to either reinforce or build upon, or is all the learning done within the classroom? I try to keep it all done within that two hours. Um, and that comes from... I guess it was, I don't know where I picked this up. It was a little trick that I saw um, at a faculty development workshop. And the faculty member put up a, like a slide, A, B, and C. It says, what do you want out of this class? And A was to make a good grade. B was to learn something. And C was to not have any homework. And then at the end he said, well, you know, and he polled the students. And the answer, he's like, well, the answer is D. If you come in here every day and you work your butt off for me every day during this time, this will all happen. And so that's, what I, that's one of the ways I try to sell it to my students. I'm like, look, don't miss class. Don't fool around during class. And if you do that, you're not going to have to study a whole lot in the end because you're going to already know the stuff. And uh, it sort of shocks them. But so there's no there's so there's um, uh, there's no pre lab or pre class questions to prepare them. No. So they're coming. They, there's reading that they can do if they want to if they need more. But I don't say you've got to read this before you come. Okay. Um, second question is so when they're broken into their groups. So this is like asking for your wisdom based upon experience. <laughs> they don't all. My experience is. Um, they don't all get it, right? So you can have four people in a group and maybe three of them got it and one of them didn't. What, do you have any advice about how to detect that or or do you set your goal a different way? Is what you're, what you're looking is for participation across the board mm -hmm. and then the outcome is going to be the outcome based upon the individuals. Well, I, st I struggle with that still. Um, we have our groups are actually pre-assigned, so I don't get to, I don't assign the groups. We have these working groups of students that get assigned by an office, and so those groups are kind of stuck together, and um, and that's okay, because there's really, I haven't found any better way to put the groups together, but I do 
pretty quickly I can recognize in a group who is the weakest link. And I just try to reach out to them, either a quick little email or, you know, maybe I can catch them after class. Like, look, if you're not getting it, you know, here's some times that we can sit down and go over this exercise together. Um, I have the, the advantage of a lot of uh, vigilance over my students by, uh, by our academic affairs office. So I know that you know this student is doing poorly in all the other classes, which means that she's at high risk for my class too. And so because we have such a small little world, um, I can pick those students out. So it's hard to detect it in the classroom, but I can use tools outside to say, all right, I, I need to reach out to you or after the first test if I have some people that are I'll, you know, in the D range or worse, the F range. We don't have, see a whole lot of those, but occasionally um, I'll reach out to them and be like, look, we, your group is probably not doing everything they can to help you, and so maybe I can pick up some of that slack. Um, I, I don't know if it's so much a question as a comment, but this is really scary stuff. Um, <laughs> it is. It's terribly frightening. Um, Right, and for context, uh, I'm Stacy's department chair. Um, <laughs> the, if I ask, him. if I ask uh, faculty members, you know, um, how do you know you're doing your job? They their response is, well, I covered all the material, and uh, so they've got you know these banks of hundreds, if not thousands, of PowerPoint slides. And if they've gotten through their PowerPoint slides while they were standing in front of the class, they feel like they've done their job. And that, that's a, a tremendous uh, point of security for them. And, and to say, I'm going to do something else and I don't know, I, I don't know how I'm going to tell if I did my job is uh, really frightening. So, I, like I said, it wasn't so much a question. I, I want to share this with you, too. This is, I'm going to embarrass Stacy a little bit, is that she won uh, and has won uh, our Teacher of the Year on um, uh, multiple occasions. And when the uh, president of the class had, gave her the award uh, last year, he said that he made her feel like a wizard of medicinal chemistry. And those are words that never occur together. <laughs> so that, that's an, just an endorsement. Thanks. And I wish that had been on the award. Um, I turned them into. He said I turned them into wizards of medicinal chemistry. I'm like, all right. Uh, so this is uh, maybe more back on the selling of the idea uh, related to that. Um, I don't teach graduate students. I teach an access institute where if you. Um, if we have a spot for you to take classes, you get in based on graduating from high school and okay. a few things. And so um, it's a little difficult sometimes. They don't necessarily have all the materials. And you did talk about motivating and, and dealing with some of those issues. Could you elaborate a bit about how the groups are helpful for that or how the guided learning really addresses some of those specific kinds of issues? And I think she, um, Alice had already asked some of this about how do you mix it? activities, but in particular, we don't have graduate students who are as well motivated as yours are, I'm afraid. <laughs> Is this any answer? Just um, trying to, I guess, talk them into it as far as this is going to be a good idea about the way you're going to teach it or um, addressing issues of working in the groups with each other or... Yes, um, but just the you know, they have all of those things in spades. They get frustrated more quickly. They give up more easily. They they don't sustain this. That they don't have confidence. They, all of the things that are small problems for some populations end up being huge barriers to those kids getting through the doors and making it out of the crap class. It's a retention issue somewhat. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Um, I could speak a little bit about the differences in the way I design exercises for my my non science majors in a essentially a freshman chemistry course, although we had plenty of seniors, uh, versus my pharmacy students. I mean, the, in the intro chemistry course, when I designed those exploration questions, they were so simple sometimes that they made my head hurt. 
And I had to do it like that because that's what they needed because th those freshmen got frustrated. They never had chemistry before. The, maybe they had only taken um, physical science in the eighth grade and somehow managed to get through high school with no science. But they got frustrated very easily too, and so I had to back off the difficulty as far as I could imagine with the exploration questions so that they're taking baby steps in exploring the model because they don't know how to read a graph. They don't know necessarily how to read a table. Um, and so, but with my pharmacy students, I can, we can jump right in and like, they already know all the terminology and I don't have to ask them as many exploration questions to get them to uh, maybe make, draw some conclusions. But other than that, I don't know if I could speak uh, to that population uh, because that, I would think that would be challenging. I know I have a, I have a good life here with the pharmacy students. Uh, they whine a little bit every now and then, but it's, uh, it's great. So let me speak to this question. Okay. Um, so Pogel in particular, which we're focused on here, really has some, for your population you're talking about, which is probably a mixture population, kids, probably some adult learners and other folks that are not real prepared and probably were not necessarily thinking about um, education after high school and have found, ooh, this actually is something that I'm going to have to do, as well as some that, you know, just for cost reasons or other things are in there as well. So you have a more mixed population than most people do. The, the Pogel and working in groups really is advantageous be, if you s set up your groups well because the, the low learners can be pulled along by people who have a better idea of what it means to be a student and how you learn stuff. You may not want to put your high with your lowest, but you mix them and it really can help out the low learners by, you know, giving them some motivation and some, some guidance. They're not having to navigate on their own. They're kind of, you know, saddled up with somebody that's pulling them along and they can see how others are doing something that's very structured in the form of this pogo instead of sitting there and trying to write down notes and figure out what am I trying to pull out of this for the test. I've got no idea because I've never done this in my life. So. The last question. Um, Make it good. Have any have any of your students had Pogel prior to coming to your class? Well, like, have they got any, had any experience at the high school level, even, or any other? I don't know of anyone course. at the high school level, but now I'm getting a handful of his students um, each year because he's doing anatomy and physiology, and so if they've had. Uh, Patrick, for that course, they know what it is, and they're like, oh, yay, Pogel again, you know, but it's really just uh, two or three, and the others are like, hmm, okay, prove it to me, uh, but it's, it's not real common just yet, and I don't know of any, as far as any other feeders where they might see, uh, see Pogel, with the exception of Emory and Henry, um, some folks up there uh, do that in, uh, I know for sure in physical chemistry. So if you're a chem major at Emory and Henry, which they graduate like three or four a year, and one of the, if you happen to come to pharmacy school at our school, then you've seen Pogel. So it's not too common though. All right, well, once again, thank you, Stacey. All right, thank you.